Stephen, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and many thanks to our witnesses for really, really useful and informative um, presentations. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, a couple of questions about the role of uh, various EU institutions in this and focusing specifically on the agencies first and then on the European Court of Justice. So regarding the agencies, um, could you perhaps all three of you, if you wouldn't mind, just give an um, assessment of the impact of the UK leaving the EU agency. As, as far as I can see, the three key agencies for the purposes of this conversation would be EASA, the ECHA and the EMA. Um, they obviously play a very important role in shaping directives and standards and missions going forward. And um, under, the, under any scenario, the UK is clearly not going to be in those agencies, and I'm assuming will not have observer status either. Can you just give an assessment of what you think the impact of the UK leaving those agencies will be? I don't really mind who goes first, uh, maybe Neil and then Paul uh, and then Richard, if you wouldn't mind. Just a, just a brief assessment of the impact of that. Yeah, I can provide a succinct answer. Thank you for the question. The HSC has an, an excellent reputation for chemicals management uh, and it will be sorely missed from the European Chemicals Agency, not only by UK industry, but from uh, but by the chemical sector across Europe. You know, it, it has a reputation for making its decisions on science and evidence rather than, let's say, political agenda. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, reach data provision is, is based on volume. And I do have concerns that when the UK reach scheme is totally independent of the Europeans agency, that the level of information that the HSE will own or will hold will be considerably smaller than uh, what is available at the European Chemicals Agency in ECHA. And, you know, and this is why I believe the annex within the free trade agreement is highly important, not only for a data sharing mechanism, but to allow the respective agencies, the European Chemicals Agency and the HSE to still have a communication channel to share uh, best practice and, and, and have regular discussions on the development of chemicals management. But, and do you think that the, our absence from the agency will turn us into a rule taker rather than a rule maker? I don't know. If, if, if essentially there is no deal, we will be totally independent. It may be that to maintain some alignment within UK industry, we, we, we will end up copying decisions that are made in the EU, but uh, I believe it's the, object, mm. it's the objective of the regulatory authority to take the evidence which it holds in the UK and, and make its decisions independently. Thank you. Paul? Um, I think the uh, European Aviation Safety Agency will sadly miss both the, the sort of UK input it gets from directly from the uh, UK Civil Aviation Authority, but also the direct input it gets from UK businesses. Um, I think the you know, the UK is is one of the major aerospace economies uh, in the world, particularly, uh, particularly in Europe. And if you like, the the expertise and input that it will no longer be getting firsthand will clearly have an impact on on its own capability. Uh, but also having a separate regulatory authority in the UK will also mean that it, it too faces a higher degree of, of complexity um, than, than is ideal. Uh, thank you very much and uh, and Richard. If I just sorry um, sorry just to pick up on the other you didn't yes. ask the rule taker one. Oh um, yes sorry I, 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 that applies to all of you as well so please do do comment it, on it, the rule taker thing yeah. It, it is it is highly likely that we will you know we, we will have to accept a high degree of um, you know the decisions made both uh, by the European Aviation Safety Agency. The issue is about how much of an influence um, a separate organisation, the CAA, has in that in their ultimate decisions. But if you're not at the table when the decisions are being made, because by definition you're not in the room, you're not in the agency, then that of course massively limits your ability to influence and shape the discussion. 
Yes. Yes, I guess, I guess you agree, yeah. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Paul and Richard. So I think first part of the answer, I think, is very similar to what you've heard from Paul uh, and, and Neil. Um, the MHRA is a very highly respected regulator and used to perform a significant share of those uh, uh, assessments that would go through the EMA, which worked as a network of national um, uh, agencies. So in that respect, they will certainly be missed. Um, I think to go further and talk about the implications for leaving, um, it depends, I think is the bottom line. It depends on whether we get that mutual recognition agreement and it depends on whether or not the approach to uh, defining a role and a vision for the MHRA for the future mm. is, is realistic and at a realistic level of cost, if I can put it that way. So um, as I said before, you know, the stringent regulators, so the top quality regulators of the world in medicines are very, very important for, for us. Um, we absolutely support high regulatory standards and we want to make sure that the MHRA is part of that international global community of, of regulators. Um, but given the size of the UK, I think it's important to be realistic about where the MHRA can potentially be a de facto rule maker, if I can put it that way, by innovating and doing new things. And I, I, so I think it's going to be a little bit of a mixed picture between areas where we're likely to be very aligned with the EU and, 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 and areas, if we get it right, where, where the MHRA could still be at the cutting edge. And if we can achieve that, we'd like to support it. Thanks very much. And a final question on the role of the European Court of Justice. So in areas where there is close alignment um, and we are in effect copying uh, the, the standards and directives and regulations that are, that are uh, generated uh, from Brussels. Um, how do you see dispute resolution working in that context? Would this in effect end up being uh, the uh, European Court of Justice that is, is acting as the referee uh, in these situations? And I'm very conscious of time, so if, if you could just perhaps just give a very quick uh, response to that. I don't mind any, anybody that has a, a view on it, please just uh, speak up. From an aerospace point of view and aviation safety, we've never gone down. There's never been an occasion where that any dispute resolution uh, mechanism was required. So we're not anticipating that it would be in, in any new arrangements either. Thanks. Similarly, from our perspective, I think the, the, the moving away from the European Court of Justice has not been one of the big issues that our members have come forward with as a complicating factor. Um, we think that that is solvable by... Uh, being a bit creative about who makes the final decision within regulation. But uh, if there's any points of detail on that that we could usefully follow up with you with afterwards, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. And okay. Likewise, from the, the chemical industry, we've also believed remaining within the reach and the European frameworks would be beneficial for the businesses and the positives would outweigh the negatives. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Now, um, I